Hello, uh, my name is uh, Dr. William Audi. I am the Chief Medical Officer for Agendia. And I would like to present for you the MindAC trial and the 70 gene mammoprint assay, long-term follow-up data in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. I will begin, of course, with my disclosure, which, as I said, um, indicates that I am the Chief Medical Officer for Agendia and have been in this uh, role since 2016. But prior to that time, and for nearly 30 years, I was uh, as a breast medical oncologist uh, on the faculty at the Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, um, as well as Assistant Clinical Professor of Medicine at UCLA. Now the Mammoprint 70 gene assay uh, provided by Agendia is um, really functional genomic profiling of early breast cancer. It provides through the expression levels of 70 genes, a prediction of the potential for dysmetastasis in the first five years of any early stage breast cancer. And the um, Mammoprint index uh, will provide either an estimate of low risk or high risk of distant metastasis as an aid in determining the need for adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, the development of the mammoprint assay is different from any of the other uh, genetic uh, and genomic assays used in early stage breast cancer. And so I would like to take a moment to describe how that development occurred. It began as a research uh, uh, project uh, uh, using an unbiased gene selection method on patient samples uh, from patients who were not treated with any systemic therapy. The question being asked was, could we use gene expression to predict which tumors have the capacity for early metastasis? And this was made possible um, because of a large uh, tumor bank that was stored in the Netherlands Cancer Institute beginning in the late 1970s. At this time, newly diagnosed breast cancer samples were stored in a tissue bank, and women were treated with surgery only and no systemic therapy. However, their outcomes over the following 20 years were known. And so when it became possible to go back and analyze these tumors by gene expression, it was decided to take a group of women who had had no distant metastasis within the first five years and compare their tumors to women who's, uh, who did have distant metastasis within the first five years, a very different clinical course, even though pathologically these tumors could not be distinguished um, uh, by their likelihood of metastasis. These groups were then called low risk and high risk, and the tumors were analyzed looking at the full transcriptome. Using uh, computer um, modeling, uh, there was a ranking performed to determine which genes could separate these two groups of tumors. And this was the origin of the 70 genes, which were most predictive of the risk of recurrence. This became then the commercially available mammoprint uh, 70 gene assay. Interestingly, among the top 70 genes um, were not ER, PR, HER2, or Key67. Although these, of course, are essential for making therapy decisions in early stage breast cancer, they were not the most predictive for the likelihood of metastasis. Now, at the time of the development of, of the 70 genes, the function for nearly half of these genes was unknown. However, over the subsequent years, the function of all genes are now known, and not surprisingly, they participate in seven pathways involved in the metastatic process, beginning, as you can see here, with growth and proliferation, angiogenesis, and local invasion at the primary site, and extending through the many complex biological steps that ultimately lead to a distant metastasis, uh, which survives as a secondary site. And here are shown the uh, mammoprint 70 genes and the one or more steps in this pathway um, which they are representing. Um, this is the reason that we think of the mammoprint assay as a functional uh, genomic assay showing the ability to metastasize. 
Now, I think it's important with a technology such as this to ask how can genomic information uh, improve the care uh, in uh, early stage breast cancer. We know that there are um, many sources of genomic information in early breast cancer, but unlike other solid tumors, DNA mutations in particular have not been highly informative in early breast cancer, other than of course amplification of the HER2 gene and possibly now the BRCA uh, germline mutation. For breast cancer, it has really been RNA gene expression analysis, such as Mamiprid offers, that has been most informative. Beyond this, however, I think it's important to also ask, what are the requirements to show clinical utility of a genomic assay in early breast cancer? Certainly, it should add greater precision beyond what we already understand from clinical and pathologic factors. In other words, it should not simply confirm what we already know from pathology, but it should add new information. And finally, it should have practical applications. It should guide therapy decisions, particularly where there is uncertainty and the greatest unmet need for improving precision. Now, we clinical oncologists who care for breast cancer will certainly agree that there are many unmet needs in breast cancer. And in fact, when this question was asked of breast cancer experts around uh, the world several years ago, an interesting uh, answer um, was produced. In 2007, uh, an international web-based consultation on the priorities for translational breast cancer uh, was conducted. And in fact, over 400 breast cancer clinicians were asked in 2006, what is the highest priority in breast cancer research? And at that time, out of the top 15 research questions, the number one highest priority, as shown here, was to identify molecular signatures to select patients who could be spared chemotherapy. In other words, the highest priority question at this time was the de-escalation of chemotherapy. And this question was really the basis of the MindAct trial which began in 2007. It was essentially a de-escalation trial. The MINDAC trial is often thought to be a rather complicated trial in its design, but in fact, it was designed to answer a very straightforward question. Can genomic profiling of breast cancers that appear to have high risk clinical and pathologic features allow us to identify women who may safely avoid chemotherapy? Now, the genomic tool that was used to answer this question was the 70-gene mammoprint assay. The designers of the MINDAC trial, uh, shown here standing for microarray in node-negative or 1 to 3 lymph node positive disease may avoid chemotherapy, elected to use the mammoprint assay, although this was not in itself an Agendia trial. I want to emphasize that the name MINDAC focuses on the use of genomic information to avoid chemotherapy, to identify genomically low-risk women who may appear as if they need chemotherapy, but genomically perhaps do not. Patients were enrolled from 2007 to 2011, nearly 7,000 uh, patients enrolled, uh, over uh, nine countries, 112 centers, as primarily a European EORTC-sponsored trial involving six cooperative groups. You can see on the right the eligibility criteria for this large prospective trial. Women aged 18 to 70 with pathologically proven uh, primary invasive breast cancer, clinically T1, T2, or operable T3, and either node negative or one to three lymph node positive disease. The results of the MINDAC trial, as you know, were initially presented in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016, at which time 60% of the enrolled patients had at least five years of follow-up, and the five-year outcomes, which were the primary endpoint of this trial, were published. Just recently at the ASCO 2020 virtual meeting, on May the 29th of this year, 
the 8.7 year long-term follow-up data were also presented, at which time the five-year endpoint was um, reevaluated, as well as now eight-year outcomes. Now, before I review the results of uh, the trial, I want to remind you of the design because MindAct really compared the assessment of risk for distant recurrence between classical risk assessment, utilizing tumor size, grade, and node status with genomic risk assessment using the MammaPrint 70 gene assay. Now, if both methods of risk assessment, clinical and genomic, agreed uh, or were concordant for a low risk of recurrence, there really was no question how to manage that patient. They would be advised not to receive chemotherapy. On the other hand, if they were concordant for high risk of recurrence, they were advised to in fact receive chem chemotherapy. Uh, again, no question as to how to manage that patient. And I could point out that if they were always concordant for risk of recurrence, there would really be no value in adding genomic uh, risk analysis because the pathology would already be telling us uh, what we need to know. However, if they were discordant for risk, uh, there would be a randomization between determining therapy based on clinical risk or genomic risk to determine treatment. Now, if uh, clinical risk was the determinant, as you can see, if it was low risk, no chemotherapy, high risk, there would be chemotherapy, uh, and the same, by the same token, the uh, genomic risk um, would also dictate whether there was chemotherapy or no chemotherapy administered. Now, the clinical risk assessment in MindEC uh, has been the subject of uh, question because initially, the uh, clinical risk assessment was performed using the adjuvant online computer algorithm. Adjuvant online is not presently online, but the algorithm, which is quite simple and shown here, is easily um, uh, used in clinical practice. Uh, low risk was defined here as a 2% or less absolute benefit from chemotherapy. Now, we all, I think, understand clinically that uh, there are women who will be um, desiring to receive chemotherapy, even with a less than 2% benefit, although um, that is not the typical uh, woman with breast cancer. Uh, this threshold, 2%, was set after asking women, what is the minimum amount of benefit that must be received from chemotherapy to make it worth your while to accept the toxicity? And the women that were asked by the Mind Act investigators indicated they needed to, to receive more than 2% benefit. Now, in uh, analyzing the clinical risk of any individual, it is quite easy to follow this algorithm as shown here. In this case, estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative, grade one, node negative, less than or equal to three centimeters, yields a clinically low risk tumor with a 2% or less expected benefit from chemotherapy. As compared to a grade two node negative tumor, uh, ranging from 2.1 to five centimeters, where the uh, clinical risk would be considered high with a greater than 2% expected benefit of chemotherapy. Now using this clinical risk assessment and the mammogram risk assessment, uh, the, uh, the trial was uh, conducted with nearly 7,000 patients. Now, I point out the clinical risk assessment specifically because this risk assessment was also applied to the Taylor X trial, which I will come back to in a moment. Another important point regarding the design of MindAC was that the primary endpoint was distant metastasis free survival at five years. This was selected because it was understood that the purpose of chemotherapy is to reduce the risk of metastasis, the one lethal event that can occur uh, with breast cancer. The five-year uh, period was selected because it had been observed that the primary benefit of chemotherapy is limited to the first five years. This observation came 
from the Oxford Overview uh, with a reference of one of those publications shown here, in which the recurrences that were primarily reduced by chemotherapy were those recurrences occurring in the first five years. We certainly understand that for estrogen receptor positive breast cancers, at least half of the recurrences may occur after the first five years. But it is also understood from the many women uh, analyzed in the meta-analysis of the Oxford Overview, that to reduce the risk of late recurrence will require something other than chemotherapy, perhaps extended endocrine therapy or the application of new uh, agents such as CDK4-6 inhibitors. Finally, the primary group of interest would be that group that was considered to be at clinical high risk by clinical parameters, but genomic low risk by mammoprint and treated without chemotherapy. Their distant metastasis-free survival at five years had to be at least 92% or better to be an acceptable outcome. Now, the initial results at five years were, as you know, published in 2016, with 60% of the patients followed up. And here are the results. Clinical and genomic risk assessment applied to all patients. And patients were then categorized into four groups. On the far left, you see the largest group where the clinical and genomic risk agreed that this was a low risk patient, nearly 41%, for which no chemotherapy was advised, only endocrine therapy. On the far right is the other concordant group, which was clinically high risk and genomically high risk by mammoprint, another 27%. Again, no question as to how to manage these women. They were given chemotherapy in addition to endocrine therapy. However, approximately a third of the patients did show a discordance between the clinical risk assessment and the genomic risk assessment. There was a small group representing 9% of the patients that were clinically low risk but had genomic high risk features by mammogram, not the primary uh, focus of MINDEC. Here, however, is the group that was the focus, the clinical high-risk, mammoprint low-risk group, over 1,500 patients representing nearly a quarter of the entire enrolled population. And this primary test group had these clinical features, which may explain why they were categorized as clinical high-risk. You can see that nearly 60% were T2 tumors, 93% were grade two or grade three, 48% had one to three positive nodes, and 98% were hormone receptor positive. Now here is the primary test analysis, which was presented in 2016. Distant metastasis-free survival at five years of the clinical high-risk mammoprint low-risk group randomized to use the mammoprint assay to determine their treatment namely no chemotherapy. And with 100% compliance with this randomization, the distant metastasis-free survival for this group was 94.7%, well above the 92% safety threshold, even within the confidence intervals. So as of 2016, MindAct was a positive trial and met its primary endpoint. Now shown here is the other randomized group in that cohort of clinical high-risk <clears throat> mammoprint low-risk patients, with the chemotherapy group in red and the no chemotherapy group, which I just reviewed with you, in blue. And for the most part, the lines are superimposable, with a p-value showing no statistically significant difference between the chemotherapy and no chemotherapy arms, indicating that there was no real benefit to the addition of chemotherapy for these mammoprint low-risk women, despite the clinical high-risk features. Now, there was a numerical difference of 1.5%, which, again, I will come back to with the 2020 follow-up data. Another important finding from the initial 2016 analysis was the subset analysis by node status, lymph node negative on the left, lymph node positive on the right, uh, indicating for the first time in a prospective randomized trial, uh, a group of node-positive women who did not benefit 
from the addition of chemotherapy. You can see again the chemotherapy arm in red and no chemotherapy arm in blue, essentially superimposable with no difference between them. This was indeed the first prospective randomized data identifying a one to three lymph node positive cohort with no significant benefit from chemotherapy because they were uh, identified as being genomically low risk by the mammoprint 70 gene assay. There were over 700 lymph node positive patients randomized in this trial. And because of this level one evidence, mammoprint became and remains now the only assay approved by the ASCO guidelines for patients with one to three positive nodes. Another important observation from the MINDAC trial was the relative comparison of clinical and genomic risk assessment. If one looks uh, at the clinical risk assessment uh, and looks at the low risk group on the left and the clinical high risk group on the right and asks, how often did the genomic risk assessment disagree with the clinical risk assessment? We immediately see that in the clinically low risk patients, in only one out of five did the genomic risk disagree with the clinical risk. However, in the clinical high risk group, in nearly half of the patients, the genomic risk indicated uh, that these were low risk patients, that in fact the clinical factors overestimated risk. And we just reviewed um, the proof that genomically low risk women do exceedingly well, uh, even without chemotherapy. Now, what this indicates, of course, is that clinically we are very good at identifying clinical low risk women but we tend to overestimate the risk on the high risk side. This was in fact the goal of MINDAC, which is why it was a positive study. The goal was to identify high clinical risk women who would have received chemotherapy based upon their clinical risk, but who are uh, able to safely avoid chemotherapy by um, the mammoprint assay. Now, based upon this level one uh, evidence, Mammoprint, as you know, was integrated into the major breast cancer guidelines. As of 2017, the ASCO breast cancer guidelines approved the use of mammoprint in both lymph node negative as well as lymph node one to three positive estrogen receptor positive uh, breast cancer, uh, specifying um, that this should be used in clinical high risk patients. NCCN also, as of 2018, uh, endorsed the use of the mammoprint assay and identified mammoprint as the only genomic assay in breast cancer with level one evidence in both lymph node negative and one to three lymph node positive patients and approved its use in both such populations. With these two guideline approvals, mammoprint uh, became the only genomic assay to be not only FDA cleared, but also recognized as having level one evidence by ASCO and NCCN guidelines. Now we come to the updated MINDAC results presented at ASCO 2020, the long results of this large prospective trial. Again, presented by the first author of the initial publication, Fatima Cardoso from Lisbon. Now, uh, many of the slides I will present to you are from the ASCO presentation, uh, which was presented in, a, in the virtual ASCO meeting on May the 29th. One of the first slides that was shown was a comparison of clinical uh, risk of the populations in MindAct and TaylorX. This was discussed because of the inevitable between two large ARC trials. Dr. Cardoso uh, did show that, uh, as we just reviewed in the, the MINDAC trial, the clinical high-risk mammoprint low-risk group uh, was made up of 100% clinical high-risk patients with nearly 29% grade three, nearly half node positive. 
And when one limits the uh, cohort to just the 91% that were hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative, same clinical features persist, 49% node positive, 27% grade three. This is in contrast to the Taylor X uh, randomized population with recurrence score of 11 to 25, uh, which you can see here was only 26% clinical high risk. The majority, 74%, were clinical low risk. Only 24% T2, no node positive patient, and only 14% grade three. A very different patient population where 75% were deemed, 74% uh, were deemed clinically low risk, where the clinical parameters were already predicting a 2% or less from chemotherapy. Now here's the 8.7 year median follow-up analysis. You can see here the rate of uh, over the years with at five years um, follow-up over 90% of the patients uh, having uh, five years and uh, over 70% of the patients having eight years of follow-up. You can see that after the median of 8.7 years, the percent of follow-up falls off rather rapidly in the nine and 10 year cohort, making these data not yet mature for evaluation. Another point that was made in the presentation was a point that had been selected for the MINDAC trial, DMFS or distant metastasis-free survival, which uh, is made up of distant relapse events or deaths due to any cause, where with DMFS, nearly 70% were distant relapses. A somewhat more accurate endpoint, which will be provided as we understand in the upcoming manuscript, is distant metastasis-free interval, which is distant relapses, uh, as well as deaths due specifically to breast cancer or for which the cause is unknown, increasing the um, events which are distant metastases to nearly 90%. This is in contrast to other trials which focus on disease-free survival or DFS. And it is important to point out, as Dr. Cardoso did in the presentation, that events in DFS are uh, nearly 60% local regional recurrences or second primary cancers not the clinical events for which we typically select uh, to administer chemotherapy. In fact, only one third of events uh, measured in disease-free survival are actually distant recurrences. Now here's the update of the primary endpoint at five years where uh, over 90% of the patients had follow-up. And you can see that the five-year DMFS has improved now to 95.1%, improving from the 2016 analysis of 94.7%. And now the confidence interval is above 93%. Again, confirming the initial results that LINDAC met its endpoint and was a positive trial. Now the longer term follow-up is shown here with both the chemotherapy and no chemotherapy arm. When one compares the Terms. Again, at the five-year endpoint, now with 90% follow-up, that 1.5% numerical difference has reduced to 0.9%, again, supporting the initial primary endpoint of the trial. At eight years, however, there did appear to be a separation between the chemotherapy and no chemotherapy arms in this genomically or mammoprint low-risk group, with a difference at eight years overall of 2.6%. Now this finding was surprising because it was not expected to see a late effect of chemotherapy after five years, as this was in contrast to what had been seen in the Oxford overview. Now the answer to this finding came in the subset analysis by age. When the analysis was focused on the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative patients who were clinically high and genomically low, 
these results were obtained. On the left, you see women who are 50 years or younger at five years uh, and at eight years. The curves do appear to begin to separate at approximately four years of time. And by eight years, there appears to be a 5% difference between chemotherapy and no chemotherapy in this younger age population. However, with the same clinical high-risk features and the same low-risk mammoprint result, women over 50 had no such difference between chemotherapy and no chemotherapy. Interestingly, this age-dependent effect of chemotherapy had also been seen in the TaylorX trial with the data shown here. Here you see with the clinical high-risk patients circled on the right, that for a recurrent score of 16 to 20 or 21 to 25 with clinically high-risk features, there is a benefit of chemotherapy ranging from 6.5% to 8.7%. The same age-dependent chemotherapy benefit that had been observed in TaylorX. I'm sorry, and in Minda. Now, Dr. Cardoso offered a possible explanation for this finding. In analyzing the endocrine therapy that these patients were given, nearly all patients did in fact receive adjuvant endocrine therapy. For those women 50 years and under who did not receive chemotherapy, 55% were treated with tamoxifen alone for five years. Only 16% had the addition of ovarian function suppression in the endocrine therapy alone arm, and actually 26% in the chemotherapy plus endocrine therapy arm also received ovarian function suppression. So the addition of this endocrine modality does not explain this difference. It was also observed that the difference with chemotherapy appeared until after four years. And this again is in contrast with where the benefit of chemotherapy had primarily which was in the first five years, as published uh, and observed by the Oxford Overview. Finally, the magnitude of this benefit was similar to the magnitude of benefits seen in the SOFT and TEX trials in which ovarian function suppression had been specifically administered. Therefore, based upon all of this evidence, it was suggested that it is quite possible that this age-dependent effect is not due to a direct cytotoxic effect of chemotherapy, but rather is due to chemotherapy-induced ovarian function suppression, essentially enhancing the endocrine therapy in these premenopausal hormone receptor positive women. Based upon these findings, Dr. Cardoso offered this algorithm for postmenopausal menopausal women. For postmenopausal women, the data are crystal clear that despite clinical high-risk features, if they are mammoprint low risk, there is absolutely no benefit to chemotherapy and they can safely avoid this toxic therapy. Whereas for mammoprint high risk, chemotherapy is indeed necessary. For premenopausal women who are clinically high risk and mammoprint high risk, again, chemotherapy is certainly indicated. But for clinically high risk, mammoprint low risk women who are premenopausal, these highly suggestive and provocative findings in MINDAC suggest that ovarian function suppression may be the reason for the observed benefit in the chemotherapy arm. And these data should really be discussed with patients in a shared decision-making process to uh, sh shared decision um, making process to possibly consider ovarian function as opposed to chemotherapy, understanding that the data uh, are presumptive in this case. Now, as is typical with oral presentations presented at ASCO, a discussant was selected to review the data, someone who was not involved with the conduct of the trial. And in this case, this was Dr. Antonio Wolf, Professor of from Johns Hopkins uh, Cancer Center. His evaluation came to a similar conclusion, which I have shown here from one of his slides. In red, he indicates that as most of the chemo 
therapy benefit is expected to occur early on, namely in the first five years, this late numerical difference in younger women is suggestive of the need for more optimal endocrine therapy rather than chemotherapy. Now the concluding slide which Dr. Cardoso presented summarizing the MINDAC 8.7 year follow-up is shown here. That with 8.7 years median follow-up, the primary endpoint continues to be met, confirming MINDAC as a de-escalation study with 95.1% distant metastasis-free survival at five years for women who are clinically high risk, but mammoprint low risk by the 70 gene assay, avoiding chemotherapy. In the clinically high-risk, mammoprint, low-risk women over 50, withholding chemotherapy to be safe uh, at uh, a DMFS gain, uh, at eight of only 0.2%. In clinically high-risk, mammoprint, low-risk women uh, less than or equal to 50 years of age, the difference does appear to be of clinical re relevance, reaching 5.2%. 5% at uh, eight years, but may actually be related to chemotherapy-induced ovarian function suppression. And this particular uh, point should be the subject of discussion in a shared process. Finally, Dr. Card did mention, although uh, she did not present or discuss it specifically, that in the uh, lymph node uh, subset analysis, Again, the lymph node one to three positive patients uh, continued to show no additional benefit of chemotherapy if they were mammoprint low risk. And we await the results of uh, this subset analysis in the subsequent publication. With that, I will conclude the presentation and thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Dr. Lee Schwartzberg. I'm Chief Medical Officer of One Oncology and Professor of Medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. And it's my pleasure to present to you a talk on molecular subtyping in the use of decision-making for neoadjuvant treatment of breast cancer. Let's start by talking about the advantages and disadvantages of neoadjuvant therapy in the treatment of breast cancer. We know that early use of treatment will uh, attack the micrometastatic disease that is present in some of the cancers that we see, despite the fact that they're clinically early stage. Neoadjuvant therapy has been well documented to debulk large tumors and in randomized trials increases the breast conservation rate uh, by shrinking tumors. We can observe the response to chemotherapy and in some cases one might consider adaptive uh, regimens and changing chemotherapy based on the response. We can use this in a clinical trial scenario uh, to use smaller subgroups of patients to predict potentially the effect of a large adjuvant trial by using a neoadjuvant approach. But perhaps the most important advantage of neoadjuvant therapy is to select patients who achieve a pathologic complete response, which has been well shown to be a good surrogate endpoint for long-term outcome after chemotherapy. There are some potential disadvantages. We don't have the complete pathologic staging, although this is becoming less and less relevant as the therapies are improving. And it is important to note that neoadjuvant chemotherapy compared to adjuvant chemotherapy does not offer a survival benefit in studies that have looked at this directly. This slide shows the results of a meta-analysis of uh, many thousands of patients who underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy on clinical trials. And it points out that strong association of achieving a pathologic complete response on the ultimate outcome for the patient as uh, measured by the event-free survival and the overall survival. In the left-hand panel, patients who achieved a pathologic complete response <clears throat> did 50% uh, <coughs> better 
<coughs> excuse me. In the left panel, patients who achieved a pathologic complete response did 50% better than those that, that did not achieve a PCR. And this translated into an overall survival advantage as well with a 64% improvement in overall survival for the patients who had a PCR. Not only is PCR a reliable prognostic marker, but it also uh, varies in the particular subgroup of patients that we're treating with breast cancer, such that for patients who are hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative, the PCR rate is less. We only see that in about 10% of patients. In contrast, patients who are HER2 positive, regardless of hormone receptor status, achieve a, about uh, a PCR in about half the uh, times they receive chemotherapy. And for the patients who are triple negative, they achieve a PCR about one third of the time. So this is a variability based on the response to chemotherapy. However, if we look at more recent PCR data from the iSPY trial, we see in the left-hand panel that achieving a PCR, regardless of the subgroup that the patient starts with, uh, leads to similar outcomes in terms of event-free survival, all of which are quite favorable, all of which are above 90%. However, the patients in each subgroup who do not achieve a PCR have a variable outcome. And as shown in purple, the patients who are uh, HR positive and HER2 positive in this group did best, whereas the patients who are uh, HR negative and HER2 positive did worse if they did not achieve a PCR with the other subgroups being in, uh, intermediate here. The point to be made is a PCR gives you a good outcome regardless of the subtype but not achieving a PCR varies by subtype. So how do we apply this data to a case? And here's a 50-year-old perimenopausal woman who has an invasive ductal cancer, undergoes a core biopsy. Her tumor size clinically is three and a half centimeters, and she has an axillary node sampling, which is positive. Her immunohistochemistry biomarkers show an estrogen receptor of 80%, a progesterone receptor 50%, HER2 negative. It's a grade two tumor with a KI67 of 18%. We would consider this patient clinically high risk because she has a T2N1 tumor. So the first decision to be made is, would we give this patient chemotherapy at all and or no chemotherapy? And we would certainly give this patient endocrine therapy. How, uh, how long should we continue the endocrine therapy? If we're considering this patient for neoadjuvant treatment, which regimen should we use? And should we actually give this patient neoadjuvant therapy or should we go ahead and operate and uh, give adjuvant therapy afterwards? So we can begin now to use genomic profiling to make the decision that uh, a patient like this poses about what type of therapy to give and when to give it. And what I'm going to show you is data using two assays, the MammaPrint 70 gene assay, which as you've seen from Dr. Aude's presentation, is very good at stratifying patients into two groups, one who has low risk of uh, recurrence genomically and one that has high risk of recurrence genomically. If we add the additional assay called Blueprint, which is an 80 gene expression assay, we can tease out the subtype of breast cancer into uh, the three broad subtypes of luminal, HER2 positive, and basal type. And if we combine the MammaPrint information with the Blueprint information, we can then stratify patients into five different subgroups the low-risk luminal, which is the luminal A group, the high-risk luminal, which is the luminal B group, HER2 divided into a low-risk group and a high-risk group, and then the basal group, which are considered all high-risk. 
What is the advantage of using a genomic profiling assay as opposed to our traditional methods of determining uh, breast cancer subtype? It's worth looking at this diagram and trying to understand exactly what we're measuring here. When we do immunohistochemistry, we're looking at protein expression, and that's the ER protein, which comes from the uh, ER gene or the ESR1 gene, and then it's transcribed into uh, ER messenger RNA. There are tests that look, can look at single genes, like target print, which will give you a measure of the mRNA that's expressed from the estrogen gene, but that by itself doesn't uh, lead to a, a decision-making uh, situation. We can look, if we like, at the estrogen receptor DNA, but that really doesn't factor into the decision-making here either. So we typically use the IHC. But the IHC is not telling the whole story. Estrogen receptor biology is very complex. The estrogen receptor protein binds to its ligand estrogen and then is translocated to the nucleus where it turns on transcription of a number of genes using a number of protein partners. And what's really important about the estrogen receptor when it binds estrogen is the genes that are turned on and off by estrogen. And these are in the pathways that promote oncogenesis and the, the, the cancer phenotype. So by looking at blueprint, we can start to assess the clinically relevant functions of the genes that are working through the estrogen receptor signaling. And that gives us a better understanding of the biology that's happening in that patient. And therefore, we can stratify these patients into the subgroups that I've mentioned already. I'm going to show you uh, some evidence using molecular data to improve selection of neoadjuvant therapy by subgroup and the role of these two assays, Mammaprint and Blueprint, using two data sources, the NBREST trial and the iSPY trial. The NBREST trial was a large prospective registry trial of over a thousand patients who were treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy and underwent mammoprint and blueprint testing. If we look what happened to these patients, stratifying them by immunohistochemistry on the left-hand side of, of the diagram, we see that the PCR rate as expected for the hormone receptor positive patients was about 11%, similar to what we saw in the uh, meta-analysis. For the hormone receptor positive patients, it varied as we know it does by estrogen receptor with ER positive, HER2 positive breast cancer having a lower PCR rate, but still uh, about a third of patients. Whereas the ER negative HER2 positive patients about two thirds of patients achieved a PCR. And in the triple negative, similar to the meta-analysis that was shown, about a third of patients achieved a PCR. So immunohistochemistry doesn't give us uh, as much accuracy as we would like in terms of trying to get a PCR for patients with neoadjuvant treatment. Now look at the right side of the screen and you'll see from this diagram what happens when patients are subjected to mammoprint and blueprint testing? The stratification in terms of the subgroup varies. So of the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative group, some of them are luminal A. The largest group is luminal B, uh, but some of them are basal. And if we look at the HER2 positive group, some of them are HER2 positive. Some of them are reclassified as luminal B, and some of them are classified as basal as well. For the triple negative group, the large majority are in fact basal, but even there, there are small populations that are subclassified differently. Now, if we look at the PCR rate by the blueprint and mammoprint together, we see that luminal A has an extremely low PCR rate as expected. Uh, these patients have very low proliferation and don't tend to get benefit from chemotherapy. The luminal B slightly higher, but still low. Now the HER2 group, uh, what we would call HER2 enriched, 
based on the gene signaling that we're looking at in Blueprint, shows that the ER positive have gone up to over 50% PCR, and the ER negative are at three quarters, getting close to what we'd like optimally. The basal group uh, does uh, about the same uh, as the triple negative group. But importantly, those patients with ER positive by immunohistochemistry are now part of that uh, cohort. So let's look at that in a little more detail. We're starting with about 700 patients who in this uh, registry cohort, 10% approximately got a PCR. If we look at the mammoprint blueprint reassignment, the data I've shown, a uh, low chance of a PCR with luminal A or luminal B. But the patients who are reclassified as basal-like, despite their immunohistochemistry positivity for ER and or PR, now one-third of them achieve a, a PCR. And that's not an insignificant number of patients. 13% of the ER-positive patients are reclassified as basal by blueprint. So this is additional information that is given to the treating physician, which may be very helpful in selecting the appropriate treatment for neoadjuvant therapy. One could ask, can you predict which patients are going to be reclassified by basal based on the range of the estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor that's found by immunohistochemistry? And this was looked at in this study. And all, uh, although the median is around uh, 10 to 15%, you can see there are lots of patients who have high expression of estrogen and are still reclassified as basal. The range was somewhat less for PR, but there were still patients who had uh, significant expression of PR up to 50% that were reclassified as basal by the 80 gene blueprint assay. And in the right-hand panel, in this study, those patients that were reclassified compared to those that were triple negative and received chemotherapy in NBREST had essentially the same degree of PCR rate, suggesting that the blueprint is in fact stratifying these patients and reclassifying them in a way that is clinically uh, meaningful and has utility. Well, why, if the, if the estrogen receptor is expressed, don't we see this, uh, this outcome for in all cases? And the estrogen receptor, uh, when positive by immunohistochemistry and genomically basal subtype has been investigated, and in some cases, it's non-functional, which means that there was no ER signaling in those particular tumors, despite both the DNA for ESR1 and the RNA present and the protein present. That can happen because the mRNA for the estrogen receptor, like other genes, can undergo splice variants in it during the transcription, which is shown in the right-hand panel here. And this just gives an example of how the gene uh, shown in black and white on top can lead to a wild-type mRNA or a splice variant of which some can be functional and some can be not based on which areas of the ER protein are missing after the splice variant cuts those out and then it's translated into protein. So immunohistochemistry will pick up a estrogen receptor protein, but that protein may not be functional because it's lost one or more domains that are necessary for its function. I'm going to turn now to the iSPY2 data. And just to refresh your memory regarding this trial, this is an innovative platform trial that looks at adding novel agents to a standard backbone of chemotherapy delivered neoadjuvantly in order to achieve uh, the endpoint of a PCR. And the iSPY trial looks to increase the PCR rate over uh, the standard therapy, uh, which would then predict for an outcome which would be favorable in the adjuvant setting from a, uh, from a uh, novel agent. 
In order to pick patients for the iSpy trial, it's designed to use higher risk patients. And higher risk patients are defined by subjecting patients who are uh, potentially eligible from, for iSpy to a mammoprint 70 gene recurrence assay. Those patients that are high risk are eligible and are placed on the iSpy trial. And those that are low risk genomically are excluded. Here is the data on about 1,000 patients who underwent mammoprint and uh, were treated on iSpy through multiple arms. Uh, all four subgroups are represented here. Uh, the HR positive HER2 negative group by immunohistochemistry represented 375 patients. And when they were tested with mammoprint, they uh, showed that one th almost one third, 29% of the high risk mammoprint ER positive HER2 negative patients were actually basal type. So this was even a more enriched population than we saw in the registry trial. And therefore, there really are a lot of patients in, um, in iSpy to look for and their outcome based on their chemotherapy. If we look here at uh, the outcome, in the left-hand panel, you see those that were classified as luminal type in the HR positive HER2 negative group had a 10% PCR rate, essentially identical to what you've seen from previous clinical trials and the recent NBRES trial using immunohistochemistry. In contrast, the basal group in iSpy achieved a 33% PCR rate, essentially identical to what was seen in the clinical trials and in the NBRES study for a similar, a different group of patients, but classified the same way as basal uh, genomically. So we now have a second data set uh, in a different setting in a prospective clinical trial setting that shows that the utility of blueprint and mammoprint together. And on the right-hand panel, you can see the consistency across the arms of iSpy that evaluated different uh, investigational agents that those patients who were luminal had a 7 to 17% uh, rate of PCR achievement if they were HR positive, HER2 negative, as opposed to those who were reclassified as basal genomically, where it ranged from 29 to 41%. These are relatively small groups of patients, and yet, despite that, these ranges are relatively limited uh, in uh, supporting the consistency of the genomic results. The other question that comes up is whether the clinical characteristics can suggest whether a patient is genomically basal uh, in the ER-positive immunohistochemistry group. And in fact, the ER positive basal cancers can be of any T size, any grade, and they can be lymph node negative or positive, with even T1 tumors showing basal phenotype, oh, genomic phenotype, I should say, 41% lymph node negative. Most of them are grade three, but even here, 12% were grade one or two. And you can't use grade to distinguish because 41% of luminal B and 13% of luminal A are also grade three. So the only way we can distinguish these patients that are uh, basal and that behave like triple negative when they're subjected to uh, chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting is through genomic profiling. And this data set using mammoprint to stratify patients into lower high risk and blueprint to further subclassify them into the five subgroups that I showed uh, can reliably identify these patients. So going back to our patient, this was a patient who was clinically high risk. Her mammoprint showed a high risk uh, result and her blueprint showed basal type. So now we're dealing with a patient where not only do we know that chemotherapy is likely to benefit, so to answer the question of chemo or no chemo, but we can also choose chemotherapy that we believe is best suited for a patient with a basal genotype uh, or a triple negative phenotype. 
And that could be a higher intensity combination chemotherapy than one would pick uh, if the risk was lower. Turning now to the HER2 group, I mentioned that even in the HER2 group, uh, there can be stratification of patients that are defined as HER2 positive, either by immunohistochemistry or by FISH, using the mammoprint and blueprint genomic profiling. Turning back again to the NBREST study, there were a group of patients that were HER2 positive here. There were 167 who were HER2 positive and hormone receptor positive, the so-called triple positive group. And in that group, as I previously showed, 39% of them achieved a PCR. But if one is to use blueprint and mammoprint here, it again stratifies the patients into two distinct groups. The enriched group, which was 72 out of these 167, and in that group, 59% achieved the PCR, similar to what we see in the ER negative HER2 positive population by immunohistochemistry. In contrast, those that were uh, reclassified genomically as luminal, mostly luminal B, had only an 18% PCR rate, which suggests that the benefit of chemotherapy and anti-HER2 therapy, which were given to all these patients, is blunted in the patients who are truly genomically not signaling fully through HER2. There were even some patients who were classified to the basal type here, which is not shown. So this suggests, and it, it certainly uh, is a good hypothesis that we can alter therapies based on uh, what the HER2 status is and the HER2 enrichment status based on the genomic expression and going beyond immunohistochemistry. This makes sense because we know that HER2 signaling is also a complex matrix pathway and has multiple regulators on it. And simply knowing that the, the protein is overexpressed uh, by immunohistochemistry or that the gene is amplified, which is picked up by FISH, does not necessarily uh, give a full picture of the functionality of HER2 signaling, uh, which is expected with these patients. If we go back to the meta-analysis and look in the left on the HER2 positive total group, we see that relationship uh, for PCR improving event-free survival. But when we break it down, in the middle group is the uh, triple positive, uh, HR positive, HER2 positive, and the distinction there between the outcomes is less. On the right-hand panel, in the hormone receptor negative HER2 positive group, we see a, a much better discrimination by achieving a PCR, suggesting these are the patients who really get that benefit. So that begs the question, these HR positive, HER2 positive patients, are they actually genomically luminal or are they actually genomically HER2 enriched? And then, one can start to ask the question, do all HER2 positive, ER positive patients require neoadjuvant therapy? Do they require cat if they do not achieve a uh, PCR, which is the current standard? Or can they be treated in a different way? Can there be both de-escalation and escalation strategies employed in these patients based on genomic stratification? And these are questions for research studies in the future. Finally, if we're going to use genomic profiling to make a decision on neoadjuvant therapy or to help inform our decision for neoadjuvant therapy, it is absolutely essential that we get the information that we're using to make that decision back in a timely fashion. And that led to this ongoing rapid genomic profiling quality project, which is using the information from uh, testing the core biopsy to deliver the genomic results and to uh, improve the operational efficiency so that early access to genomic test results might lead to a more efficient and effective early stage breast cancer management decision. This diagram shows on top our standard workflow today. 
a patient presents, undergoes a biopsy, a diagnosis is made uh, histologically, and estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 are ordered, and the results are become available in a few days. And typically at that point, a decision is made to do a genomic profile, uh, either via the core, if you want, want to do that before surgery, or sometimes it, and often it's delayed till after surgery to make that decision. So the genomic profiling results are typically not available when the surgeon, the medical oncologist, and the patient meet to make a shared decision about uh, whether or not the patient should have neoadjuvant therapy. The rapid preoperative results program is shown diagrammatically on the bottom. And here, the, uh, the assays are done in a different time fashion. First of all, when the patient undergoes a biopsy, an additional core is taken and sent for the genomic profiling preparation, which involves RNA extraction. So we're ready to do the profile. As soon as the ERPR and HER2 are available, if felt, um, uh, felt that the patient may be eligible here, that patient would undergo genomic profiling based on the HR status. So typically this would be the HR positive patients. And then the results can be av available very quickly in time to make that pre-op consult and to make the decision. And so this is an alteration in uh, the flow, the workflow and how the work is done to deliver these results quickly. And in the community setting, when uh, you're seeing these patients, having all the information in a timely fashion is really important. So the potential benefit of using this rapid genomic testing is a faster treatment decision. And using this process, the results can be available within five days in time for the consults. With this information, given the genomic reclassification that I've shown, one can potentially make more informed management decisions and accurately identify patients that can need or forego uh, neoadjuvant therapy. And I think it's fair to say that patients' uh, satisfaction goes up when they have all the information and they're not waiting on it. It's a very stressful time to be diagnosed with breast cancer and to be waiting for bits and pieces of the information and particularly when you're going to go undergo neoadjuvant therapy and the tumor is still uh, in your body, patients get very stressed. And this is a great way to reduce their stress level and anxiety. So if we take the information that I've shown about using Mammaprint and Blueprint and apply it to a potential preoperative algorithm for the ER or HR positive HER2 negative early stage breast cancer based on this genomic profiling, we come up with this sort of approach. If a patient has a mamma print low and the blueprint confirms that it's luminal A, that is a patient who with a clinically low risk uh, situation like a T1 tumor should go right to surgery. Um, there really would not be a particular benefit in undergoing any type of neoadjuvant therapy there. These are patients at low risk, and then the decision about adjuvant therapy is made after surgery. For the patient who has a larger tumor, but is luminal A, there might be considerations for neoadjuvant therapy, but in this case, a potential option would be neoadjuvant endocrine therapy, which has been shown in trials uh, to also be effective, and particularly is useful in these luminal A, mammoprint low, blueprint luminal type tumors, when, particularly when they are larger. For patients who have high risk tumors, uh, as defined by mammoprint, the blueprint will stratify them into luminal B, HER2, and basal. For the luminal B patients, these patients would typically uh, be considered strongly for neoadjuvant chemotherapy or to undergo surgery first with chemotherapy using the type of regimen uh, that one would pick for a luminal type cancer. For the HER2 positive group, these patients will typically undergo neoadjuvant therapy. That's recommended today in most guidelines for most tumors uh, that are at least T2 or N1. Uh, 
and oftentimes even somewhat smaller tumors. And these patients would undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy with anti-HER2 therapy uh, as would be standard. For the patients that are classified and reclassified here as basal, because all of these patients starting off again are ER positive, one could give consideration to neoadjuvant therapy and using a regimen that would typically use for, be used for a triple negative breast cancer. And in some cases that may be a more intensive regimen or a longer duration of neoadjuvant therapy to get the best results and the higher chance of getting a PCR. So if you look at uh, this algorithm, this points the way to starting to use the genomic profiling to make decisions in a more refined way because the information uh, is of higher quality, if you will, and gives you uh, an opportunity uh, to know more about the biology of this particular tumor than one can get from immunohistochemistry alone. So thank you very much for your attention.